Um, this uh, seminar has been um, uh, kind enough to let me uh, fly a chapter of a book each year for the, about the last five years. Um, it's a book on ministerial formation and virtue ethics. And uh, it's a book that made considerable um, progress last autumn, um, even towards a conclusion. Um, but then I picked up some teaching at Bristol Baptist College and Trinity in Bristol, uh, and that's been filling my hours with prepping for sacramental theology, and then some teaching at Regents, which has also filled some time. Uh, and so that, that book is still not finished. Uh, but I do think this is probably going to be my last contribution at this seminar based on that book, uh, which is quite fitting because it, it relates to the first um, paper that I gave from the book, uh, I, one of a, a number of chapters in the first part of the book, um, and uh, a comment uh, from Peter Stevenson. I'll tell you how far back it was because Peter was still here in those days uh, before going to South Wales. Um, uh, he said, had I thought of looking at this through the lens of, of wisdom? And I had to confess in the question and answer that I hadn't. Uh, and so um, I uh, decided I must do so. Um, and this is the fruit of, of that work um, on, on thinking about formation and, and wisdom and virtue ethics. So that's where it's come from. And uh, we'll see where it goes today. Proverbs 8, 22 and 30. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work. Uh, the me, of course, is wisdom. Then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. Quotes. I'm so glad my daughter did not decide to study theology at university. I didn't want her to lose her faith. End quotes. Uh, that's not me saying that because I don't have a daughter. Um, but you know the kind of phrases you hear from sometimes. Such comments will not be uncommon to many pastors from an evangelical background. Theology, the study of God, is a dangerous thing. Best avoided if a biblical faith is to be maintained and a simple faith remain unthreatened. The desire for a lived faith or wisdom, sapienta, we might say, to be kept away from scientia, knowledge. This fracturing of the church and the academy, theology and practice, and wisdom from knowledge, has a long pedigree and contributes to the suspicion that many beginning ministerial formation have toward the academic and theological components of their formation. Best stick to the Bible. The manifest nonsense of these comments and prejudices are almost immediately obvious, yet they remain commonplace in many churches and have a considerable foundation in the historic split between wisdom and the science of theology, a split that is being challenged widely today. Ministerial formation is one context in which wisdom and knowledge can be reunited, and therefore, ministerial formation as growth in wisdom is a helpful model to place alongside the others that I am offering in the analysis uh, of formation uh, and virtue ethics. That's the substance of the book. Let's think, first of all, then, about virtue and the voice of God. The way in which theology, practice, and wisdom relate as practiced in the early church, is described by Daniel Treyer as, quotes, in hot pursuit of sapienta, wisdom, a kind of knowledge, with teleology, the formation of virtue in God's people. That's uh, from this uh, book, Virtue and the Voice of God, Towards the Theology of Wisdom. I commend it to you. The fragmentation of this early endeavour, separating theology and wisdom, is a complex story. But until the rise of the medieval university, theology was not unified into a separate discipline under one disciplinary rubric, but was seen as a commentary on scripture, as indeed Calvin conceived of his institutes of religion, 
and was seen, secondly, as an apologetic tool. Eve Congar, the Catholic uh, theologian, and Edward Farley identified two different moments when this separation between wisdom and theology emerged. Conga points to Peter Abelard when theologia takes its modern meaning and in the 13th century its epistemological flavour. Contemplative illumination became subordinated to scientia, to knowledge, although we must note that in Thomas Aquinas the link was not broken. Indeed, while Aquinas is often thought of as the archetypal representative of scientia, he remains a sapiential theologian, a wisdom theologian with a strong contemplative streak. The loss of wisdom was evident long before the Enlightenment. But Farley identifies the loss with the rise of the modern age, with theology as a habit of the human soul as opposed to a scholarly discipline within the academy, lingering long after the Reformation. In the earlier case, the breaking of the link between wisdom and understanding as knowledge is epitomised by the dispute between Abelard and Bernard. That's St. Bernard. Theology as speculation will be distinguished from theology as contemplation of scripture and the church fathers. Theology as schooled speculativa would be distinguished from theology as cloistered activia. Sorry, activa, not activia, that's a yogurt. Um, love and knowledge no longer co inhered The reformers were ambiguous about scholasticism opposed to its arid speculation, yet adopting its systematic approach, such as Calvin's Institutes. And that lent themselves to a 17th century reformed form of scholasticism. Nonetheless, theology was deemed to be the servant of the task of Christian living. And in Calvin, as indeed in Thomas before him, knowledge of God and knowledge about God are intimately connected to virtue and wisdom. The biblical scholasticism that followed was an attempt to move from immediate knowledge of God to one mediated by scripture, further separating theology from wisdom as the contemplation of God. In the contemporary modernist and postmodern context, there have been various attempts to relate the faith of the church to the academy or to relate prayer and knowledge. The continual erosion of epistemic justification for belief since at least Descartes continues to undermine the biblical foundationalism that starts by stating that the Bible is God's word, which begs precisely the question asked in the modern academy, on what possible foundation can you say that? One response is to attempt to make those justifications, while another is to retreat into a religious ghetto where the question is never asked. Another move is to replace talk about God with the study of the God talk of those who confer with it, the Christian community. So the problem of God disappears to be replaced with theology as a social science, discussing the anthropology and psychology of a peculiar community that continues to believe in God in the face of the onslaught from a materialist and sceptical culture. Where the object of theology, grounded in a post-enlightenment epistemology, is moved from God to talk about God, then what should be joined together, God and word, love and knowledge, sapienta and scientia, church and school, tends to be put asunder, despite good intentions. Another attempt, allied to Lindbeck's experiential expressive knowledge, is a move to theology as a disposition of the soul that has the character of knowledge that shapes the soul. The work of Edward Farley is a prime example here. This approach is not without its problems, notably with the readiness with which it turns again to theological anthropology. 
A final attempt has been to reorder theology to reflection into the validity of Christian witness. Charles Wood finds in theology a unity of vision and discernment and attends to the task of theology rather than its subject per se. Theology is concerned with a historical question. Is this truly Christian witness? A philosophical question, is this witness true? And a practical question, is this witness fit for purpose? This is a turn to the practical, be it with Browning, a turn to reflection upon the transformation of individuals and communities, or theology as mission, or prayer. Here also is where McIntyre's discussion of the practices of a tradition come into play. Uh, and if you've heard any of these other ones, you know McIntyre appears every single occasion. He has to. It's part of the deal. Uh, theology is about formation. Then McIntyre's focus upon a recover recovery of the ancient notice, notion of practices creates a place where virtue is exhibited. In this sense, it is not so much theology itself that is a practice as the formational task that theology serves. So James McClendon, developing a Baptist theological frame, sees theology as a second-order practice located in the church's teaching ministry, while David Kelsey has noted how widespread is agreement that the aim of theological education is a kind of wisdom. Quotes, This wisdom concerning God embraces contemplation, discursive reasoning, the affections and the actions that comprise a Christian's life. This agreement about the focus upon wisdom is important, but the content of that wisdom is more variously expressed. Is it contemplation of the divine or reasoning about God? Is it obedience or practice? Reinhard Hutter's answer is a renewed vision of theology as church practice. Theology for him is a first order practice and quotes, the teleological logic of theology's salvific economic taxis is the immediate consequence of theology as a reflective actualization of the church's soteriological telos. Therefore, the learning of the faith remains the goal of its presentative communicative aspect, albeit not its criterion for truth. The, the initiatory acquisition of faith is joined by a learning of faith, one imminent to faith that begins daily anew and never ends. Perhaps, perhaps best called peregrinational learning, that is the learning in hearing in the Christian peregrinatio, that's Latin for pilgrimage. This notion of theology as the learning of the faith on the journey of faith, its pilgrimage, is tied to a specific and binding horizon, the biblical canon and doctrina, and by specific and binding configurations of language and activity, which are the core practices. Here then, theology becomes the discovery of wisdom and the formation of the Christian, a growth in that wisdom. Now, in his extended consideration of theology and wisdom, Daniel Trier asked whether theology is practical reflection on or for practice, or reflection embedded in another practice, such as education within the academy, or itself, is it a practice? He also asks which wisdom and answers from within a biblical theological framework. Wisdom might be techne, a skill or craft, or it might be phrenesis, Aristotle's higher order instrumental virtue of practical reason whereby the prudent person knows what to do in any given situation. This could be simply sophistry, replacing wisdom, and turning all human knowledge to a scientific technical utility without any reference to God. Such, for Old Testament wisdom, is the way of folly. The heart of this way of life, this way of wisdom, is sapientia, the knowledge of God, or in proverbial language, the fear of the Lord. In considering the roots of this wisdom, 
Paul Fittes argues that whereas the late modern world has sought those roots in Aristotelian phrenesis, there should be a shift to locate them in the Hebrew idea of Hokmah, which develops into the Sophia of the New Testament. And this is from Paul's um, uh, Bampton Lectures, it was, I think, the Bampton Lectures, uh, rewritten. Uh, Hebrew Wisdom and Christian Doctrine in Late Modern Context, published a little while ago. Uh, Paul Vidis is a um, uh, professor in another place, as they say. A um, good deal nearer to where I live, I have to say, but that's another matter. Paul is Professor of Systematic Theology at uh, Regent's Park, uh, at uh, Oxford University and... Uh, Research Fellow at Regent's Park College. Fides brings this concept of Hokmah into conversation with a Christian theology that is aware of its context in the late modern world. He notes how there has been a suspicion of scientia in the new search for wisdom and a recalling of the Christian tradition of sapientia. This has resulted in a stress on practice over theory and is a mood that Alastair McIntyre's discussion of the virtues has influenced, not only in theology. In his argument, Fides supports Trier's argument that a Christian phrenesis, or ethical discernment in practical situations, is entirely enabled by Sophia, or by seeing God in Christ through revelation, as normatively found in scripture. The scripture thus forms the person in phrenesis rather than providing a comprehensive material for application to particular judgments. Phrenesis is a gift from God and is nurtured by the spirit in response to prayer, who hones it through habits of obedience and informs it by scripture. It is precisely here, says Fides, that the Hebrew concept of wisdom has much to offer with its unique integration of phrenesis and sophia. It also sounds a common note with late modern culture and its central concern about the relation of self to the observable world around and the sense of crisis in the dissolution of older modern certainties that the human self controls uh, its own destiny. So turning to the New Testament, the fear of Yahweh is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. In 1 Corinthians, Christ is both our wisdom, 130, and he enables us to become wise as we have his mind by the Spirit, chapter 2, 7 to 16. Where the proverbial teacher was concerned with contrasting the wisdom of God from human wisdom, which is in fact folly, Paul has in mind a Hellenistic philosophy with an ascetic bent that provides one of the roots for Gnosticism. The wisdom that Paul commends is cruciform in structure, a gift of God to people who have lived foolishly together and would never find it on their own. If Christ fulfills the Torah as wisdom, then the Holy Spirit also fulfills the Torah by enabling wisdom to be found. This wisdom, found by the Spirit through prayer, feeds into the Christian tradition through adaptation of Aristotle's practical reason. He distinguishes, that's Aristotle, five qualities to which the mind achieves truth in affirmation or denial, namely art or technical skill, scientific knowledge, prudence, wisdom, and intelligence. In the late, in the Old Testament, a number of Hebrew words are rendered in the Septuagint by phrenesis vocabulary. And there is a place for the idea of prudence in, for instance, Proverbs 3.13, 7, 7 verse 4, 8 verse 1, 10 verse 23. Its usage in the New Testament is ambiguous and can be seen as negative, as a mindset separate from Christ. But nonetheless, it is used Christianly, albeit reframed through Christ. So, the distinctively Christian virtue of humility and selflessness is the Christian way of prudence. Paul uses the verb phroneo in Philippians to 
verse 2 and 5, 3 verse 15 and 19, 4 verse 2. And elsewhere, to redefine what prudence looks like, only by a radical transformation of meaning can this action be motivated by anything that is recognisably Greek phrenesis. The New Testament reordering of uh, phrenesis is nurtured through scripture. It's transmission by those who teach it and by the spirit. This phrenesis is a type of knowledge and a regulative virtue standing at the intersection of ethics and epistemology with an ethos of divine creation and command. Phrenesis is nurtured by the spirit in response to prayer who hones it through habits of obedience and informs it by scripture and Christian teaching. This combination of gift and nurture, indeed grace given by various means of communal nurture, strongly implies that wisdom is not a possession of a privileged few, but a privilege for all who live in God's new covenant. And the purpose of this is to bear fruit, preeminently love. Furthermore, his possession of prudence is corporate, achievable only in relationship to others. Tria argues for a full integration of theologia into Christian practice. In his argument, Tria then proceeds to make steps that need not concern us here, learning to speak of God, that's doctrine, the nature of biblical interpretation, a question of hermeneutics, and the relationship between phrenesis and Wissenschaft. But he then turns to theological education as the school of the triune God. And he calls for theology to regain its sapiential voice, that is, its biblical voice, within the community of the church and by the Spirit's role in the formation uh, uh, and reception of doctrine. An account of the regular fidei in terms of a particular Sophia Phrenesis oscillation accomplishes this, providing the substantive account of Christian virtue and accountability for Christian phrenesis while avoiding a construal of divine communicative action that makes theology exclusively propositional or biblical interpretation excessively theoretical and methodological. And thirdly, by, especially by construing the Bible's narrative coherence around the God-man Jesus Christ, not only in terms of the Father's revelation or discourse, but in terms of spirit-led, faithful humanity in the formation of reception. This gives wisdom an embodied, active, communicative and fully Trinitarian character that other notions of biblical unity or functional descriptions of the regular fidei, that's the rule of faith, can lack. Quote from Trier. So here then we have an argument for the reconfiguring of theology as wisdom and the formation of the Christian community as a process of conformity by the spirit to the way of Christ as determined in scripture. This has considerable benefits to our concern for models of ministerial formation. It enables the conveying of the faith, the regular fidei, to be less about a series of propositions that theological students must learn and accept, as a process whereby people are formed in the spirit by those doctrines understood as wisdom. I mean, read that one again, that's important. It enables the conveying of the faith, the regular fidei, to be less about a series of propositions that theological students must learn and accept as a process whereby people are formed in the spirit by those doctrines understood as wisdom. It enables theological education, the acquisition of ministerial skills, and practical formation of character and spirituality to co-inhere without collapsing any one into another. They maintain their distinctive contributions but relate to one another as dimensions of this training in wisdom, understanding, episteme, skill, techne, and prudence, phrenesis, are woven together to form Christian Sophia, wisdom, which elsewhere, that's in the book, we will call discipleship. Paul Fittis wants to take things a step further than wisdom enabling an authentic discipleship. In his Bampton lectures, in which he engages the late modern culture with Hebrew wisdom literature and its world, 
He moves from language of God being mediated by, for instance, the incarnate son, to one of participation in God's movement. Quote, Hebrew wisdom literature does not at all represent wisdom as a mediator between level, different levels or spheres of reality. The early Christian theologians employed the concept of an intermediate logos, adapting to reflect their conviction that this Christ was not some inferior semi-divine principle, but fully one with God. They lived with the contradiction that this mediator was at one and the same time equal with God, except for Arius, who logically concluded that this paradox was unsustainable and argued that this mediator was simply a creature, albeit the highest. This language of a mediator bridging the gap has left its indelible mark upon the whole of theology subsequently. The Son of God bridges the gap between a world of divine perfection and a fallen creation. It has resulted in the tension of ascribing to God the philosophical attributes proper to unchanging being, impassibility, immutability, and non-temporality, while at the same time upholding the biblical picture of a God who has a compassionate love for the world. If, however, we start not with a mediating logos, but divine wisdom, we find a language of participation replacing language of mediation. This is important. This is important. Since the ecclesial consequences of mediating language is to look for those humans who also mediate God's presence in as singular a fashion as Christ, the Bishop of Rome in the church, the priest in the parish, the emperor of Christendom in the secular world. The consequences are often those of political and religious oppression. Fides argues instead that, uh, quote here, when the writer of the Wisdom of Solomon celebrates wisdom as one and many, abiding in herself she can do all things, he's not thinking of a bridge between a transcendental one, uh, sorry, a transcendent one and the plurality of the finite world, but a wisdom who enables her friends to enjoy the manifold phenomenon among which they live. Wisdom is not projected or extrapolated from a remote deity in order to make contact with a world of change and decay. Wisdom does not in any way bridge a gap between transcendence and imminence, between creator and created. Rather, we have seen that the spirit of wisdom which stands over against the world as its observer is also the same spirit which is within the world, holding all things together. We might say that wisdom flows forth from God so that human beings can, can participate in that same flowing movement. Reading the wisdom literature should encourage a paradigm change in Christian theology from mediation to participation. Wisdom as spirit in the wisdom of Solomon hints at a complexity within God's life that is later to flower fully in the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. It is not that either Lady Wisdom or spirit can be simply equated with persons of the Trinity as the church later articulated them, whether Son or Holy Spirit. The point is that similar insights into movements of personal life within and from God, inviting participation, are later to be expressed in the Christian concept of Trinity. The Son, or Logos, comes forth from the Father, as does the Spirit. Not to link a remote God with the world, as in the mediation model, but so that the world can share in the movements of self-giving within God, participating in the flowing movement of love between the Father and the Son in the ever-surprising newness of the Spirit. You'll recognise, if you know Paul Fiddy's uh, theology uh, of the Trinity, that that's very much in accord with uh, what you will read in, for instance, Participation in God. But in terms of ministerial formation... The forming of wisdom in a person, so that the acquisition of ministerial skills and practical formation of character and spiritually co-inhere without collapsing anyone into another, is, a deep, is deepened by an understanding that this formation is a means, one amongst many, of participating in the divine life. Christ is being formed in the life of the person, not simply knowledge imparted, skills acquired, and character shaped. Uh, I've argued in uh, my book with Unveiled Face 
that this participation is expressed in the human face as being reflected glory. Fides puts it thus, as we relate to others in compassion and empathy, so we become sympathetic readers with God, and so we find our true self. It is this participational model that helps us distance ourselves from an overly technical version of ministerial formation, where, at its worst, it is a collection of hints and tips for the conduct of ministry, or, at a more sophisticated level, of course, such as it is exercised here, an emphasis upon the tools, skills and ability that give expression to ministerial practice. This emphasis upon core ministerial competences, which I wrote, to the diminishment of ministerial virtues and ministerial character is always a risk in a culture that wants the maximum effectiveness at the minimum cost in time and money. This is a culture to which the church has become too accustomed. The book of Job might serve as a counter to such a tendency. I don't intend to fully discuss here the nature or theology of Job, you'll be glad to hear. Others have done so quite adequately. Suffice it to say that Job is a protest at the reduction of the way of wisdom to a simple cause and effect linkage. Act thus and you will be rewarded, act wickedly and you will suffer. Where instead there should have been a continual disposition to live according to the fear of the Lord with religious humility. This leads to an interpretation of human experience that reads back into it divine action. If Job is suffering, which he most assuredly is, then it must be because he deserves this form of divine retribution. So his counsellors argue, recognise your sin, God will forgive and you will be rewarded. Indeed, Job subscribes himself to this transaction, except he knows that he does not deserve it. He has not sinned. The book bursts through the hardened arteries of dogmatic wisdom to return the flow of wisdom to its original wellspring. We live in an age of technical explanations for the efficacy of action, and the temptation is to promote a way of ministerial formation that accommodates itself to this spirit of the age. Follow this method of church growth, practice these pastoral exchanges, use this evangelistic tool, and ministry will be successful, we are told. But there is a mystery about this. Good and effective ministers come unstuck. Their ministry fails, not because of personal moral failure, but because of the exigencies of life in their community. What is needed is a different model. One that starts with a participation in wisdom as virtues are acquired. Virtues that are not in themselves another set of tools, but dispositions of the heart, movements of the soul, habits of the spirit. Where shall wisdom be found, asked the riddle in Job 28.12. It can only be found by exercising it, an experience one comes to through appropriate behaviour in religion and ethics. Here, we live in an open space through wisdom in which we can know a God who is hidden but not absent. This is a presence which never imposes and where we can learn to be present to others without forcing ourselves on them. A wisdom theology for today will maintain that at any moment, anywhere, any place can become holy. It can become the no place where wisdom is encountered, opening up to a space where there is room to dwell it's a quote from Paul Fiddes. So let's turn uh, to look uh, at the uh, uh, book of Proverbs briefly. One of the benefits of taking wisdom as a model for ministerial formation is its intricative approach. While much of the book I'm writing adopts a systematic approach for the sake of analysis, the way in which the various elements of formation cohere is essential. Forming the wise minister or developing wisdom in the minister's life and practice cuts through the distinctions between function and being, between character and spirituality. One might do worse than make a reading of the book of Proverbs a requirement at the beginning of the testing of a sense of call and again at the significant stages of formation that ensues. The way in which the themes seem chaotic or haphazard reflects the way in which formation is not a steady planned progression whatever the best intentions of those who plan college courses, but rather a growth and regrowth of a variety of themes that are interrelated. 
The variations in personal stories, temperament, calling, ability and gifting among those being formed for ministry gives a wide range of possibilities for the formational process. Some will come from a steady, loving and Christian background. Others converted from backgrounds that are inimical to the development of stability in personality. Some will come with high levels of intellectual functioning, others with lower. Some with already developed skills in relationships, others with marked edges to them that make relational functioning difficult. Some start with a strongly developed pattern of discipleship, others less so. And some will come with a disciplined pattern of spiritual practices, others with next to nothing in that regard. This is the reality of human nature. And wisdom is an ancient way of encompassing much of this, especially in the areas of way of life, relationships and work. The first way of approaching formation in this model will be to reflect on the origins of this concept in both ancient Israel through its wisdom literature and the ancient Greek world through phrenesis, practical wisdom. But the second theme in this chapter is to extract some themes from this book of Proverbs and Scripture and explore what those biblical writers had to say to the young approaching the beginnings of adult responsibility and how this might offer some insights to the elements involved in ministerial formation. It is not a book that says much about habits and patterns of prayer or worship, and neither is this true of Ecclesiastes, for instance. Nor is it so helpful in describing the areas of knowledge required of the minister beyond the basic orientation towards the fear of the Lord. It doesn't say anything about biblical studies or theology or history or culture or liturgy or so forth. But it does say a great deal about habits of life dispositions of the spirit or soul and the dangers to be avoided these are the areas of character development that lie deeply within the formational process through the pursuit of intellectual formation the developing of habits in the spiritual life and the acquisition of those skills in preaching pastoral care and mission that are among the training elements of formation there is at the heart of formation the growth in a godly wisdom a stable and humble character, and the work and speech that flows from it that becomes the way of life or the way of being a minister of Jesus Christ. The young man instructed by the writers of Proverbs is admonished to seek wisdom, to be humble, to resist laziness, to be holy and calm-tempered. He is instructed in relationships with women, children, parents and his wife. He is to have an integrity of life that is reflected in business, home, the wider community and his neighbours. He is to be gracious towards those who oppose him, avoid excess in eating and drinking and seek advice from the wise. There is much to learn about how to speak wisely and the need to obtain discernment and a single-minded devotion to God. The young man, in the later chapters at least, appears to be the one who will come to rule over Israel. And so there is advice about conducting state affairs and warfare. We will want to reframe the teaching of Proverbs to reflect the differences between its patriarchal society and our more egalitarian and gender equal one, but but this is not insurmountable. The minister who lacks understanding of this or that theologian is ignorant of a particular period of church history, who lacks proficiency in the biblical languages or a grounding in philosophy, will probably survive in ministry if they are wise and compassionate and humble. The minister is not a very, who is not a very powerful preacher is rather awkward in some pastoral situations and is neither a great evangelist nor a visionary, lead, a visionary leader, may struggle at times. But if they are wise, of godly character, and known for being a prayerful person, then they will survive. Such a person is probably the more typical minister than the great leader, powerful preacher, transformative pastor, saintly guide and effective evangelist that most would aspire to be. But if the latter lacks wisdom, then despite their great gifting, disaster always lurks in the background. The theme of the book overall is ministerial formation through a lens of developing the practices associated with virtue ethics. These practices do not themselves focus on the virtues, but provide the context in which the virtuous life is formed. And something very similar might be said about wisdom. There are certain habits of life that are self-evidently ethical in nature. Eschewing adultery, 
having on his business practices and being generous hearted towards enemies, for instance. But much of what characterizes the wise life has a deeper vein of integrity running through it. Single-minded, it begins with the fear of the Lord, with a relationship to God. It is discerning, hard-working, and refrains from saying or speaking too much, and like this post-grad seminar. Above all, it is not proud or arrogant, but willing to be instructed, teachable, and disciplined. The foundational ministerial virtue, I think, is humility. And in Proverbs, this virtue is similarly foundational. I would even say that the New Testament descriptions of the ministerial life in, for instance, the pastoral epistles, make little sense without the background of the Proverbs. The qualities of a bishop or deacon in 1 Timothy 3 reflect the qualities of the wise person in Proverbs. Temperate and not a drunkard. 1 Timothy 3, 2-3. Look at Proverbs 23, 29-35. He's to be an apt teacher. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2. Look at Proverbs 15, verse 23. And not, quotes, puffed up with conceit, 1 Timothy 3, 6. Look at Proverbs 11, 2 or 16, 18. Amongst the many accounts of wisdom literature as a genre and tradition in Israel, I've chosen Fides' own account, not least because his purpose, like mine, is not to lay a foundation by discussing the literature for its own sake, but rather to put it to the use of a wider discourse. The texts primarily are Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, the wisdom of Ben Sirah, or Ecclesiasticus, and the wisdom of Solomon. Where the prophetic literature is a call to hear the word of the Lord, wisdom literature's call is to look at the world around. Now the prophets often see visions, and the learners in the school of wisdom should listen to their teachers and parents. But the characteristic cast of mind which persists from the earliest to the latest period of wisdom is one of observing the details and particularities of the human and natural world. The concept of creation in wisdom literature is different to that of Genesis 1 to 3, bent as that is to the story of redemption. People are created beings, but not shaped by a story of paradise and fall. The real you is simply the quotidian you, and so wisdom lays stress on the flourishing of the human self in its relationship to others and the creation. The material that has survived to form the extant wisdom literature probably emerged from several social and cultural contexts. And the search for a profession of the wise to accompany the priest and the prophet is probably misguided. We might then speak of a wisdom movement or a wisdom mood rather than a wisdom school just as I am suggesting a late modern mood in our present world. Proverbs undoubtedly is influenced by other cultures, but the mechanism for that influence is uncertain. Equally certain is that the editors of this collection of sayings adapted foreign sayings to their own religious convictions. At its heart is the search for hokma, translated wisdom, but broadly meaning the knowledge of what to do. It incorporates learning and intelligence, skills such as those of an artisan, and the character that is transformed by the education received at the hands of the wise. Central are sentences that contrast right behaviour with erroneous, righteousness with wickedness, and wisdom with folly. Some are presented in the early chapters as instructions from a father to his son, And prominent is is a narrative that uses two female figures. Wisdom, present at creation and carrying divine authority, and her contrast, the foreign woman, evoking those foreign women who ruled Israel and led her astray. In Proverbs 1 to 9, wisdom is essentially the light that enables her followers to stay on the path to life, and in effect, exhortations to live life according to the Torah. Where the Deuteronomist sees the consequence of following or disobeying the Torah on a national scale, Proverbs takes the individual micro-scale viewpoint. Both assume that the Torah is normative for Israelite life. At its heart, therefore, Hokmar is not so much intelligence or theoretical understanding as right conduct in obedience to the will of God. Wisdom becomes the mediator of revelation, Proverbs 8, 1 to 21 who summons and invites men, Proverbs 9, one following, to understand the original divine order in creation, 
or be it available fully to God alone, Job 28. The one who seeks wisdom requires a basic disposition of humility, for this is the stance of the student before their teacher, the disciple before their master. In a church culture that often privileges success over faithfulness, strength of leadership over godly example, this fundamental disposition is sometimes overlooked. In part, this is because ministers in training often come now from an already successful career elsewhere, where half a life of experience to offer, and often in church leadership. This sometimes breeds a resistance to learning, to being formed afresh for a new calling, and reflects the way in which poor practice can be tolerated. So Proverbs' emphasis upon humility is significant. Wisdom comes from being reproved by God, changed by him. Quotes, uh, Proverbs 3, 11 to 12. My child, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be wary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves the one he loves. Those who hate to be rebuked are stupid. 12 verse 1. But the wise listen to advice. 12 verse 15. Pride is dangerous. 18, 12. Before destruction, one's heart is haughty, but humility goes before honour. And 28, 29, 23, a person's pride will bring humiliation, but one who is lowly in spirit will obtain honour. The fool thinks their own way is right, 12, 15, but the wise person seeks out those who will offer them counsel. Without counsel, plans go wrong, but with many advisers they succeed, 15, 22. The reward for humility is riches and honour and life, 22.4. That doesn't count for Baptist ministers, by the way. And with it, the esteem of others. Let another praise you, but not your own mouth. A stranger, but not your own lips, 27.2. 3 verse 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This humble self-knowledge, open to the transformative power of the Spirit of God to reprove us, and resisting proud self-promotion lies as a foundation for the wise life and the ministerial calling. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom and humility goes before honour. The second theme from Proverbs will be single-minded. The writer of Proverbs asks his young disciple to keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. Put away your crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forwards and your gaze be straight before you. Keep straight the path of your feet and all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Chapter 4, 23, 27. The character that is developed in the minister needs such single-minded focus and direction. Arising from the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. This single-minded integrity of life will then issue in avoidance of sexual immorality, such as adultery, and moderation in those ways of life that can so easily, uh, uh, that can so easily bring the ministry into disrepute, such as gluttony or drunkenness. Proverbs thirdly speaks about right relationships, and uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of that. Uh, uh, it's, it's in the, the notes you've got. Uh, a fourth theme is anger. Controversies are often conducted with anger and loss of temper. It takes but a moment's loss of control and a harsh or angry word spoken at a leader's meeting or in a pastoral encounter and trust can be lost. The writer of Proverbs has much to say here. One who is quick-tempered acts foolishly. Uh, one who has a hasty temper exalts folly. But whoever is slow to anger has great understanding and is better than the mighty. It is best to avoid the company of such people. Make no friends with those given to anger and do not associate with hotheads. 22-24 Growing in wisdom means picking the controversies that really matter and engaging in debate without losing one's temper. Another theme from Proverbs is discernment and discrimination. And we'll won't do that bit because we're running out of time. Marriage, there's a lot to say about marriage, about how marriages should be conducted. Uh, which we won't look at either. And then there's also much to say about work ethic, and this will be the last bit I do. There we can. 
have a talk about it. At least in part, I've been, uh, I need to start a little bit further, sorry, I'm editing on my feet, always a bad thing. There is wisdom required on the part of those selecting for ministry. And admitting that for all the exceptional gifts in evidence, some are ill-suited to ministry because of the choice of partner they made long before a call was sensed. I'm enormously grateful that Jill, my wife, knew I was called to ministry before she agreed to marriage. And I knew that her temperament, her own sense of call and faith, were able to cope with the challenges. Uh, not that she'd ever been the traditional minister's wife, staying at home except perhaps when our children were very young. She's had her own career as a university lecturer, had leadership roles in the church we attend, and as far as I can recall, has never led a women's meeting or arranged the flowers. Nevertheless, sharing life with a ministerial spouse is demanding and calls for a certain kind of person to rise to that challenge. It is better to admit that for this couple or that, ministry would not really flourish and avoid the distress to themselves and others when the partnership doesn't seem appropriate. At least in part, ministerial marriage stresses, ministerial marriage stresses arise from the sheer expectations of hard work that arise. The loss of privacy as life is lived in the goldfish bowl and the way in which unpredictability and availability combine to frustrate well-made plans. The writer of Proverbs has much to say about the lazy. They are like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes to their employers. And their ways become overgrown with thorns. They do not plough in season and the walls of their vineyards are broken down. Much is made of their sleeping in bed and the woeful effects upon their prosperity. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed warrior. A proverb that repeats its earlier version in chapter 6 where the ant is the example to follow. Go to the ant, you lazy bones, then you will rise from slumber. I think that overwork is probably a more frequently observed besetting sin of ministry than laziness. But the fact remains that the minister, alone and self-determining for much of the time, can easily succumb to laziness. It is not so much that a prolonged after-lunch snooze becomes too regular a feature of the working day, and with a very late evening the night before and another anticipated the coming evening, a siesta is no bad thing, but that the difficult and unpleasant things are avoided. The difficult relationship is not confronted, even if the visits to the compliant elderly are assiduously carried out. The attractions of the sermon preparation elbow out the difficult demands of administration, or vice versa. While mission and reaching those who are not part of the community is replaced by a mild chaplaincy to the faithful. Yes, the hours are still long, the right people impressed, the aspirations and expectations of managing trustees satisfied, but the hard edge to the call to go the way of the cross is avoided. The demands of courageous ministry replaced by the familiar and safe. The minister has become lazy. It is all talk and no walk. Here's the verse I'll close with from 14.23. In all toil there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And that's true for ministry as much as anything else. Uh, there's other stuff which we could think about from Proverbs about speech and language and such like. Wisdom as a means of looking at ministry and the way in which we root our practices in the acquisition of it. Uh, that's uh, what I'm attempting to do in this chapter, which uh, has yet to find its final version. You will understand that from hearing some of it. Um, but uh, I present it here because it's a work in progress, and I value your comments. OK, thanks so, so much, Paul. Uh, look forward to reading the book after that. It's uh, excellent. Um, just to, to let you know um, before we continue that Paul's chapter um, is available to you we haven't printed it but if you'd like uh, to receive it um, then please give me email uh, Katie Walsh and uh, she'll be able to send you it as, a, as an attachment um, 
Paul, I, I really appreciated that. I thought that you um, you've opened up this discussion in a really compelling way. And this is obviously these are obviously issues that, as a as a college, as a community, both as students and as staff. Uh, these are issues that we're thinking about a lot um, and trying to embody some of these, uh, these principles. So I'm sure that, um, that what you've shared has been helpful and has raised uh, a lot of questions, a lot of uh, fruit for, um, for thought and discussion and debate. So uh, the, the floor is open uh, if anyone would like to, uh, to start off with the first question. Andy? Yeah? You can tell I have a question. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. That was great. Uh, my, my personal interest, I think, is beyond behaviour and the being of people and what drives that behaviour. So you made a comment about the danger of using competencies if you focus on effectiveness and action and behaviour and not the person that I am being formed to be. <laughs> and I was reading one we knew him yesterday who seems to focus much on that. Look at the person that you are, and you yourself learn this a bit. And I just wonder, this is only one element. Mm -hmm. It's using wisdom, literature, to be pragmatic and focuses on behavior and action. What you need to do is there a danger that you then focus on that, mm -hmm. and not what God's calling in me. Um. Let me answer it in two ways. I, I, I think you can read with some literature, particularly Proverbs, in that kind of a way. Um, but it seems that it is always um, within the, the whole corpus of the literature um, challenging its, its own confidence assertions. Um, so there is a theme, whether it... I, I don't know enough to know whether it's kind of early wisdom literature which says do this, live like this, and you will be successful, happy, and wise, and live to a ripe old age, um, to which Job is manifestly the, the, the contradiction and the challenge, that life ain't that simple. Um, so there, there is a way of looking at it like that. But I think the other way of looking at wisdom literature is this is, is not so much the provision of a series of hints and tips of how to be a successful person as the forming of a person to be wise. So that through developing those habits in some areas of life, something deeper is happening. Um, and can I relate this to ministry? It seems that you, you, you can provide people training and forming for ministry with, with lots of um, um, you know, hints, tips, rules, regulations, protocols, all the rest of it. Things like, you know, don't, don't visit people after 10 o'clock in the evening. and um, you, you know, Particularly if it's a single person of the opposite gender, just don't do it. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty wise stuff. You could put it into a rule. In fact, we've given it for some very strong advice in, in, in the Guide to Good Pastoral Practice. Um, but you come to the point where, where, where following those rules and regulations, those guidelines, um, you, you, you end up with the, with the case which isn't met by those. And, and, and if you're simply forming people to follow a set of rules, then at that point they come unstuck. They don't know what to do. Um, whereas if it's viewed as a means of forming and shaping habits of the soul, or dispositions of thinking and, and living, then something different is happening. A, a wise person is being shaped. And out of that, that disposition of life it's possible then to come to the kind of conclusions of how you might conduct um, concerns and, and conduct ministry when the rules don't tell you what to do. The other way of looking at that is through Alistair McIntyre and, um, and his um, um, understanding of, of, of the practices, how if you are formed by the practices of a tradition or a profession, um, it's more than um, simply acquiring how to be, how to be good. And the example I've used elsewhere is, 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 the, uh, is the craft of making pots, being a potter. Uh, and, and in the early stages, you, you, you learn the skills, <coughs> how to throw the clay and how to, you know, how to, how to move it, how to make the, the, um, 
the glaze is and how long to fire it for. You learn all the technical stuff in order actually to make a pot. You do so uh, sitting at the feet or alongside or watching the practice of someone who makes you know, pretty good pots. But in the end of the day, those practices, those habits, those skills are formed so that what you end up with is a good potter. Now, a good potter isn't just someone who makes good pots, but a good potter is someone who can discern what is a good pot and what is not a good pot. And people who know about these things will look at a pot and say that pot has integrity about it. Um, it's, it's, it's the outward sign of something that's, that's been formed within the life of the person who is the potter. So that person's life has got some integrity about it, and that's then evidence in what they do. Um, a good potter will have the, the goal of making good pots probably higher on their agenda than, than, than making lots of money, for instance. Um, and so there's something about the acquisition of skills and being formed in habits and practices that develop the virtues in the person. Uh, Alistair McIntyre says you actually can't develop virtues in people other than by learning practices. Another example might be um, but becoming a good doctor. You can learn all the skills you want, like uh, in surgery and, and the rest of it as a doctor. Um, but uh, w what is a good doctor? It's not just someone who's proficient in medicine, but it's someone who has learned through the acquisition of that skill and knowledge and practices what it is to be a good person, who knows when to stand up and challenge the consultant who is not a good doctor, <laughs> who knows how to break bad news and journey with someone being told that they have got two weeks to live, um, who knows how to um, uh, live their life so that what happens in their private life has some relationship to their practice as a doctor. Uh, particularly true, I guess, for GPs if they're deeply rooted in the community. Um, I mean, who really wants to have confidence in a GP if they are, a, you know, a womanizer or the, the female equivalent? I'm not quite sure what that word would be, but, um, you know, f f it doesn't have any integrity in their personal relationships. Do you trust that person when they're looking after your... So there's all sorts of stuff about being formed to be a virtuous person, but it comes through learning those habits and skills. And I think, in a way, that's what... Um, wisdom literature and Proverbs is saying as well this isn't acquiring a set of, of rules of how to live, although it might look like that superficially, the acquisition of those rules and following them does something much deeper, it forms a person and I guess that's really what I, I, I long for out of theological education and largely I think it does it actually, I'm not critical of that um, I think we could do it in a more focused way but but through all of the skills of biblical and, 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 and theoretical and practical knowledge that we gain through ministerial formation, what's it all about? Well, it's to form a good minister, not just an effective or proficient minister. And believe me, congregations know the difference between um, a proficient practitioner, and that's better than an, um, an incompetent practitioner, <laughs> but they look for something deeper than that. For instance, they want to know that their minister loves them. That's a virtue. That's not simply a skill. Does that help? It does. I suppose my concern and my challenge with McIntyre is that learning the practices or embedding the practices doesn't necessarily produce the virtue that you would like it to produce. I think it depends on how you, you develop the practices. And, of course, in a, in a technological age, we tend to develop practices set free from the virtuous context. So, you know, I think that wouldn't have been the case um, in, for instance, the medieval guild. Right. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Paul. I really, really appreciate it. I suppose my question is, is, is along the lines of balance here. Um, 
and, and I guess there's a theological point in the heart of it somewhere, uh, but with the emphasis on wisdom, uh, you've almost answered this in your last question, but the emphasis upon wisdom, it seems to me that there is a risk that we, we lose the dimension of skill and gifting and um, the theological issue, therefore, is when you were dealing with Paul Fiddies and you're talking about, uh, from the Old Testament context, the spirit in terms of a participatory theology, uh, somehow contrasted to a theology of mediation. Um, now, uh, what about a theology that wants to say that part of the function of the role of the spirit is to particularise a given situation within a context of community and role? Um, so, um, if, if all of the emphasis goes upon the spirit in, in the context of Paul's using a participatory theology, is there a risk that actually we, we talk almost exclusively about wisdom and about being a wise person? But you can be a wise person and not be a church minister, you can be a wise person and not have certain types of gifting. So, it seems to me the sort of theology about the spirit will probably determine the understanding of about forming wise people alongside the context of particular gifting yeah. and calling and so on. Yeah. And it's the question of the balance there. Yeah, yes, it's, it's the balance. And I suppose I'd want to say, um, in, in, in my defence, Malat, that this is one chapter amongst five opening chapters, which um, uh, the other four of which tend to emphasise a much a much more of a particularised um, forming of, of, of people for ministry. I mean, Paul is arguing um, in the Bampton Lectures, um, he's not writing about ministry or ministerial formation, he's writing about, um, a, a, about um, uh, Christian living more generally, uh, which is something that, you know, we don't just want wise ministers, we want wise disciples uh, across the board. Um, but um, uh, and I'm not entirely convinced by Paul's participatory language. Um, um, and I think one of the difficulties uh, of it uh, in the context of ministerial formation is, is um, the way that it interacts with my very sacramental understanding of ministry. So that ministry is a mediation of something. Um, but I, I, I think it... And this is one of the bits of the chapter that are not written yet. Um, I think there must be a way of, of holding together a, a, um, a mediatory um, understanding of ministry uh, and, and, and a participatory understanding of, of what it is to, to participate in God. And I wonder whether the key, oh, I'm thinking on the top of my head there, maybe answering my own question, is the notion of a nested series of priesthoods. So if we think of God's way of, of being is always to use a particular in the general to mediate himself, then we could think of um, uh, humankind, human beings, as the priesthood of the divine image to the rest of creation. You like that, um, and then and then you say, well, how does that hu how is how is that human beings in general then mediate? Well, they're, they're mediated by the church. God is mediated to humanity by the church. So you've got another little like a Russian doll. So the church is the mediation of God to humanity. Humanity is the me mediation of God to the rest of creation, stewardship and all that rest of it, the image of God. Uh, how does the church experience God? Well, the church experiences God. Um, through a whole range of ways, but one of it is, is through the media, mediatorial function of priesthood so, um, or ministry. So um, you have ministers in, in part with others, but ministry as mediating God's presence to the church, the church mediating God's presence to humanity, humanity mediating God's presence to, to, um, uh, to the created order, and all of that being in the context of participation in Christ. Would that work? Oh, like that. Okay, <laughs> well, Graham likes it. Um, that, that might be one of the ways of integrating yeah. um, participatory so, language. Well, actually, you could actually integrate these two, but I've never mm. worked through anything. Yeah, we don't nick it from each other, really. Well, I, I like it. Paul, I'm going to 
Well, I was just wondering if uh, wisdom is something that can be quantified. So it, there's a biblical imperative to grow in grace and knowledge, but I think there's also a very clear imperative to grow in wisdom. Hmm. Um, at college, we have unit scriptures and administrative requirements and learning outcomes for particular units, and it's usually, it's always, there's always some subjectivity um, involved in making a judgment as to what, how someone is in, is gaining it or obtaining um, academic understanding. But is there a way of quantifying the extent to which students are growing in wisdom? Are there proven models? No. no. Okay. <laughs> I don't think this becomes one, one, this doesn't become one, one amongst many of you know, the things that we, we try and work out how, how well a person is doing, because I think it is much more of a sum total. Um, therefore, it is, um, Perhaps we have to take the risk of being countercultural and saying there are some things which are non-quantifiable. Um, there are some things which can't be shaped to the um, to the culture of um, league tables, um, and um, and descriptors of excellence and all the rest of it. I heard a horrible thing the other day from the lips of David Cameron, so it's not surprising. He was talking about education, and he said, we will not tolerate anything except the good and the excellent. And you think, what kind of culture have we come to? A, that we can actually distinguish everything on those bases, and that failure is not tolerated. What do we do? Well, we act without mercy. That's what we do in our society. Um, and I suppose one of the things I would want to perhaps say about, you know, just as we, 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 it's very hard to quantify a person's growth in spirituality, and there's a whole growth in spirituality in the book, um, it's very hard to, to, to quantify a person's growth in wisdom. The only thing is, I suppose, you know it when it's not there. Um, when, you know, the, 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 the minister in training, the student minister, you know, is damn stupid. <laughs> you kind of you kind of see it in its absence quite clearly. Um, they might be academically brilliant. Oh, they might uh, absolutely. I've yeah, I, I've known plenty of damn stupid ministers who are quite bright. Um, I'm probably one of them. Um, so I think I, I I think we've got to accept there are some things that are non quantifiable, uh, and 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 say to. Um, um, because the difficulty is, you, you, living in a litigious age, if we're sort of assessing people on stuff that we can't put into numbers or justify before the employment tribunal or whatever, um, it, it gets quite scary. Yeah, 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 sure. um, because we may be making judgments which are kind of a hunch and, and must be challengeable, of course, because hunches must be challengeable. It might be something which is which we can't put down on the, on, on, on the scale of descriptors. Um, and I guess in the end of the day, it's those kinds of things which, which actually do shape what is um, good, I don't mean morally good, but um, something deeper than that, good ministry or um, not good ministry. And I don't mean by not good ministry, evil or ineffective, but simply something about it lacks integrity. Yes? I did say earlier, and you nodded at me, and you're not ignoring me, because I don't want to move Oh, do you have your hand up? Okay, yes. don't then. Yes. Don't then. Don't then. Don't then. Yeah. Um, okay. it, it seems to me that um, if you are redefining or defining, reclaiming the hokma, wisdom, ability to live life with skill or being skilled in godly living, then some of the criticisms that have been raised or the questions that have been raised, um, you should resist moving away from the original definition that you've come up with. So I, it, it, it causes me to wonder whether you're not absolutely persuaded yourself yet about Hockman or wisdom as the ability to live life with skill, because those seem to me um, at the very least, somewhat quantifiable. Um, not necessarily among the 
regards to TV, though they're mean, I mean, in many ways, mm. credits are screen. Mm. But I suppose what I wanted to say is I resist the temptation to go too far down the road that Graham is trying to push you and revisit again or strengthen again the definition of wisdom as, you know, taking the hot mm. ability to live life with skill. I think there's something in that mm. that can be linked with the ILO's skills knowledge character stuff that we don't want to lose. Yes, um, thank you, Dotha. I think. Um I mean, I, I guess what I'm doing, this is a chapter near the beginning of the book, although it's written quite late in the book, book's writing, um, which is trying to say, let's, let's look at ministry through a number of lenses. So I've looked at, looked at it through the lens of, of um, creation and redemption as the, as the overarching story of God's dealings with the world. I've looked at it through um, uh, McIntyre and virtue ethics. Um, and this is another lens through which to look at it. Um, sometimes looking at the world through three or four different lenses, they're not always entirely compatible, but, but the benefit of looking at it from a different way is, is, is greater than, than the, the, the degree of incompatibility that may arise out of it. But I do think there is something about, about wisdom um, and um, in terms of forming ministers, because um, it, it, it is. Uh, it emphasises that we are forming not isolated practitioners of a series of skills, but we're forming men and women who will be able to be a minister amongst God's people. Um, and one of the descriptors of that for me is the exemplary disciple, um, where, where Paul will say in his letters, "Look at my manner of living. You know, follow that." Uh, I think we ought to aspire to ministers who are able to say, with honesty, humility, and integrity, if you want to see what it means to follow Christ and live a Christian life, look at me. Um, now, um, recognising that there will always be a, 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 a that will always be shaped by you know failure and whatever, and, and, and the sheer arrogance of it sounds kind of is, is almost breathtaking <laughs> when you say it like that. But actually, the truth is. Whether or like it or not, um, people will follow what, what they see in their minister. Um, and so we, we might as well aspire to wise, godly living that people will follow than something else. So, yeah, I want to keep the wisdom thing in it. I suppose in terms of formation, if we had the courage to say that um, all those that we are forming for ministry will have will be required um, to embrace a form of close apprenticing and accountability, uh, which is very difficult to do if you're just fetching up in college for two days a week. Um, but what happens for the other five days when you're not here and you can't see it? And, um, and the sense of saying, actually, if we are, um, it's the kind of formation that you get if you're a novice in a monastery. Because there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> Everything gets exposed. Um, and um, I, I just wonder whether there isn't a place somewhere in the process where, where, whereby we put those we're forming for ministry under some kind of broader scrutiny to see what, how wise living is being lived out in, in their life. You know, um, uh, and uh, we certainly have fewer candidates for ministry, I guess, probably, because <laughs> who'd want to do it? But, um, but it is precisely, it seems to me, what, what Bonhoeffer was, was trying to do at Finkenwald. Because here, here were these men, uh, I think they were only men, um, in the confessing church, being formed through saying the Psalms and having silence and living with one another and speaking with one another and being pra and learning theology and the whole thing in this Bonhoeffer recognised as almost a quasi-monastic community uh, where there was no you know there wasn't very many places to hide with the aim of forming men um, and today we would say men and women who can conduct ministry in the face of the kind of opposition threat 
and horror that they were facing uh, in the latter years of the 1930s in Nazi Germany. Now, uh, I, I think... I think von Hoff was onto something there. He realised that you weren't going to do that in some other way by putting them through a university course. You needed the closer scrutiny in order to form these men to, be, to have integrity and to have courage uh, and all the rest of it. And so you get a much closer. I don't think we can return to four-year residential courses as the only mode by which we form people for ministry. But, but I think it's not beyond the, the, the wit of women and men to devise something to come alongside what we are doing that might be able to help reflection upon the whole of life being formed as an exemplary disciple rather than just the things that we're doing. But, um, it's, it's good to be reminded of the virtues of the monastic tradition as a, a way of uh, growing in, uh, in virtue. Um, Michael, you had a question. Um, quick, quick question. Very, very quickly, it's just an observation, really. Uh, picking up on Joshua's um, comment on assessing wisdom, and uh, you picked up on spirituality. Um, coming from a secondary education teaching background as a RE specialist, um, one of the criteria for Ofsted was um, development of children's education would be based on academic, moral, and spiritual development of the child. And many uh, teachers from different cur uh, curriculum areas would often come to our e specialists in particular and say, oh, how do we deal with this um, assessing spirituality uh, within the child? And, uh, and it, was a, it was a big problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the RE department had struggles with assessing that particular issue with the children, but yet, it was a, 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 a development that was hidden, mm. a very important development within yeah. a child, and it's so totally different in, within adults. Within yes. Professional yes. Development. Um. Uh, of course, the, the, the difficulty with, with, with our um, secular educational uh, establishment is, what, is that while they put that language in to, um, into the curriculum, um, uh, they, they, they haven't a clue about the content with which to fill it. Uh, and it's interesting, if you look at the latest version of... Um, uh, it's no longer called Every Child Matters, but it was when it was first came out, Every Child Matters. Um, the, uh, the, 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 in the early years curriculum, um, I know this because my wife's an early, early years academic, um, they've now removed the requirement for spiritual, um, and it's replaced by something sort of called well-being. Uh, and that's the best, that was the furthest they could get, you know, something... Um, as as as, as fog-like as that. So I, I, I think I think you're right. I, but but within the church, we should know what we mean by um, by, by virtue and spirituality and, and integrity, even if the wider world struggles with it. So uh, and maybe that's one of the means by where we have a voice into the wider world by saying you aspire to these things. Um, you haven't a clue what it means, but we do here. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Paul, thanks ever so much. That's been really helpful for us. Just, just um, um, I wanted to say something about the book, because the book is coming out quite soon. I, I know it hasn't been published yet. but it's, oh, It hasn't um, been written. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I settled on the title. So <laughs> uh, well, the, the, the working subtitle is, is, is uh, Ministry of Formation and Virtue Ethics. But, okay. but I haven't come up with, with the sexy three-worder, three you know. Um, that will summarise it. Um, I'm about one and a half, maybe two and a half chapters away from completing it. And um, I need to really get that done by, by this summer. So I'm hoping the, the full text will be kind of available to me to send off to a publisher in the autumn. That's what I hope. Well, we look forward to, to Maybe that. next year it will get published. Been, maybe next mm. year. But that's been not just helpful, but actually quite... Uh, inspirational and empowering as well and uh, I really appreciate it I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone else. <laughs>